Uh, so the, uh, the uh, webinar is being sponsored by SAPA, which is based in Paris, France. Uh, let me just give you some online meeting instructions. And uh, those instructions are you can change your name, but it's better for everyone to know who you are. Uh, you are automatically muted if you are not a speaker. So use the chat function and I can uh, interact with you that way and ask and answer your questions. Your camera is automatically turned off. Uh, you're also welcome to invite other participants or after the recording of this session, uh, please pass it along. Um, please use social media to, um, to track the discussion uh, at SAPA.org. Uh, and you can also have the participant list. It's available on LinkedIn and uh, we'll have a short poll afterwards. So thank you a lot for that uh, little housekeeping note. Um, what I would, okay, let's see here. So first of all, let me introduce SAPA, which again is sponsoring the uh, webinar here today. It was founded in 2019. Headquarters are based in Paris, France. Uh, it's a social purpose organization, also a social impact organization. And the co-founders, uh, Farid Badash and also Raphael Hera, have uh, over 25 years dedicated to impact and sustainability. Uh, they have had over 100 uh, career engagements across industry sectors uh, and have a global network of 150 organizations, international organizations and experts. Um, and most importantly, uh, SAPA designs, deploys, scalable, innovative program uh, solutions to help uh, companies and investors tackle very complex social problems um, in order to build resilient, inclusive, and competitive operating models and business practices. Um, and the three core areas of impact uh, are sustainability advisory, innovative investment, and advocacy. And for those who have joined us a little bit later, uh, my name is Julie Morocco. Uh, I work for SAPA uh, in the New York office uh, in sustainable finance. Um, thank you again. Uh, so let me try to figure out how to advance this here. Fantastic. So we have a seminar here today um, in mitigating organizations' human right risks. The webinar uh, is really inspired by the, cert, uh, the current social movement of human rights and social justice right now. Equality, dignity, opportunity for people of all uh, color around the globe, particularly those in the Black, Indigenous, and people of color or BIPOC communities. Uh, human rights is such a broad topic and can mean a wide spectrum of issues pertaining to social justice and equality. Um, but these issues are very much the fabric um, in our business politics and also our philanthropies. Um, so it's especially important right now in this uh, seminar is timely because uh, many, many companies and uh, uh, foundations, uh, investors are facing um, ESG, sustainability impact, um, and are feeling the influences for this type of investment. It's gaining traction around the world. Stakeholders and importantly, investors are adopting and implementing environmental social governance strategies and asking very hard questions about how the components of ESG can play a role in the organizations uh, and companies' operations. Um, investors are asking about supply chain risks. They're asking about reputational risk, which leading to market risk. And so this forum is an opportunity for those directors, uh, leaders, officers uh, to come become more familiar and uh, knowledgeable about human rights and to understand the risks that your organizations may face under EU taxonomy and indeed the global regulatory landscape and begin to move those uh, risks, um, I'm sorry, begin to mitigate those risks and also start asking some of the questions. Some of the questions are, what are human rights? How do I define human rights in my company? What's important now? What timeline am I facing? How do I begin to look at reporting on human rights to my board and the stakeholders? So our speakers will be addressing the definition and implementation, the regulatory environment, and also uh, measurement and reporting. So simply the what, the why and the how. So with me here today are Karen, uh, Karen, Karen Ryan. Karen is a senior policy advisor and director of human rights, women and girls at the Carter Center outside of Atlanta, Georgia uh, in the United States. Karen has a storied 20 year career working with President and Mrs. Carter and works around the globe implementing policy, conducting negotiations and addressing compliance in the areas of human rights. 
Uh, Karen has most assuredly been in some very difficult conversations with world leaders around the globe. So we're very happy to have her here uh, again dis discussing the definition of human rights. Um, Karen, uh, I also uh, enjoyed that you're a student of the arts uh, graduating from Berkeley College of Music. So, uh, great. Um, also, uh, Fareed. Uh, uh, Badash, uh, CEO and co-founder of SAPA, the organization sponsoring the event, is here. Fareed has been working in corporate social responsibility and sustainability for over 20 years. He has worked with NGOs, he's worked with corporates, he's worked with academics over the course of his career, and in fact is also a university professor as well as running a company. Um, his background includes uh, the working at the Business for Social Responsibility, Areva, HP, Deloitte, and has a, he has also has a tremendous academic record in sustainability and a PhD in organizational sociology. Fareed's gonna talk about the regulatory side of the environment. And then Vincent uh, Segarink, who's a policy analyst at the OECD and the Y Center, which we'll hear more about as he goes through his uh, comments. Uh, Vincent has literally worked and studied around the globe, Swaziland, Morocco, Brazil, Bangladesh, and now Paris. Uh, Vincent has worked at the Grameen Bank. He's worked at Dexas Consulting in Washington, DC. And uh, he is a policy data and statistician expert and he'll be discussing measurement and reporting. So with that, uh, I am going to, um, advance the, uh, oh, there we are, uh, advance the conversation and turn it over to Karin Ryan. Great, and I have to figure out how to, yes, hang on one second, I've, I've got that here. Sorry about this, everyone, hang on one second. There we go. Yes. I I I can you hear me? Yes. Welcome everyone. It's really exciting to be part of this, uh, this exciting discussion. I saw on the flyer, you have my very short haircut photo, which is okay. This is a uh, pandemic hair, uh, <laughs> but it's all right. Um, uh, really nice to be here. I think this is an essential conversation right now and I cannot wait to hear our other speakers um, address this. So my, my task is to say, what is human rights? <laughs> which is, I, I always love, even though it's way too hard. Um, we always tend to take on impossible tasks at the Carter Center. So um, I'll, I'll take on the impossible task of doing a quick definition. Um, you know, our modern understanding of human rights really came out of the horrific suffering from World War II, where the governments got together in 1945 and established the United Nations to end war or at least to try to end war. <laughs> um, and then the, in 1948, established the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And, and what's important about that is that by uh, convening the, the, the existing powers at that time, this is, this is uh, by the way, before the independence movements uh, um, where uh, colonial empires were still in place, but this, those were that were empires and countries at the time got together and, and actually, um, came together around a revolutionary document, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that was partially forged in uh, Fed, uh, FDR's Four Freedoms, the freedom of speech and conscience and the freedom from fear and want. These four freedoms were something that he was implementing in a domestic space here in the United States with social security and, uh, and other social protections, but also freedom of speech. Um, and then his wife, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, took that um, forward and helped the, the nations of the world develop the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And even prior to that, when Roosevelt um, and Churchill were sitting on a, on a um, ship in the Atlantic, they came up with the Atlantic Treaty, which the Atlantic, um, the Atlantic, there's a different name, I can't remember what it is, Atlantic Charter. And it called for the end of tyranny in our world. Now, this was a, a precursor to launching the, the uh, or to, to taking on the Nazis, of course. But there was a young lawyer in Southern and South Africa who answered the Atlantic uh, Charter's call for, to, for the end of tyranny. His name was Nelson Mandela. And he said, okay, you wanna talk about ending tyranny in our world? We'll take you up on that. And for the next 50 years, he led his nation on a campaign to end tyranny in South Africa. 
And for, so for those next you know, decades after the, the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you really had an ideological battle about what human rights is all about. Civil and political rights advanced by the West, economic and uh, social rights advanced. Uh, uh, there was this sort of ideological war when they were negotiating the follow-up treaties to the declaration. So there are two treaties, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. This was a reflection of an ideological divide during the Cold War. And that's really unfortunate because these rights and in the years, intervening years, human rights activists have been saying, we have to see these rights as interdependent and completely mutually reinforcing. Um, and Martin Luther King at the end of his life said, you know, if you can't afford to feed your family, what good is the right to vote? At the end of his, he never said what good is the right to vote, but he challenged uh, uh, the, his, his own movement to take the movement for civil rights and move it into the, to the movement for equal rights, economic, social, and cultural rights. So I work for a, a man, former president Jimmy Carter, who talks about this and said, you know, he, he, he's written about being on a battleship in 1945 when the UN was formed and later how moved he was with the creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And when he was in the White House, he signed both treaties against the uh, pressure from senators and others who said, you know, economic rights, that's not, some, that's not what we do in America. You know, we are capitalism, freedom, that's our, that's our thing. Um, but he believed firmly in his own life uh, in Plains, Georgia, while he was governor of the state of Georgia, and when he was president, that these rights must be pursued in tandem, or you will have a situation where uh, extreme capitalism will result in disparities that uh, violate the basic rights of people to an adequate standard of living, which is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. That includes a right to housing, a right to sanitation and water, a right to fair wages. All of these ideas are rights. They are not just the byproduct of a healthy economy. Um, and what we have seen, um, and, and this is because we know that human beings, if you, you know, for example, if I live in a city and my city uh, does not provide uh, clean water into my tap, um, and I'm getting polluted water in my tap, this would not be acceptable. And then in, in, we know that when that's happening in Flint, Michigan, it's still happening. Um, this is a human rights issue. Um, and if the, the government doesn't act and the, the government doesn't work with the private sector to find a solution, this is a violation of human rights. Uh, we know this in our heart. We know that instinctively that you must have these conditions to live. Um, however, in, you know, in the starting in the, the 1980s, the sort of the neoliberal economic model where growth of GDP, uh, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats um, formula was seen as a way to bring more people out of poverty, more people out into the economy. But even the IMF has admitted that this has failed uh, to, um, to really bridge the gap. Um, so, you know, and in, in certain countries that were resisting uh, austerity measures by the IMF, like Portugal, for example, or Spain, you could see that the investment in the social sector by the state had great results. It both boosted the economy and uh, uh, helped people enjoy their human rights to, uh, to uh, fair wages, to housing, et cetera. So this is the right time to be talking about this. And what I, the, the only way I would suggest mitigating organizations' human rights risks um, is to first admit that this is a very tough, tough, uh, uh, tough question. This isn't about charity. It isn't about humanitarianism. It isn't about Band-Aid solutions. Um, we have to do both. We have to take care of the humanitarian needs that people have urgently now. But then we have to look deeper. If you are a company that has real estate uh, holdings, for example, and you know that in the Georgia housing market where I live, there will be 40,000 families evicted very soon because the housing prices have spiked so high, so, so dramatically, people cannot afford rent. 
Uh, my county has 4,000 Section 8 public housing or Section 8 vouchers, which give uh, uh, rent money to people in need with 40,000 people applying. What happens to those people? Um, this is a question for the state because we must regulate, uh, we must ensure that there are enough vouchers for people, but it's also a, a question for private sector. If you have real estate holdings and you are scooping up huge amounts of real estate with the goal of uh, maximizing prof profit only, then this is a human rights violation. Uh, people are homeless. Um, so, uh, you know, you can apply this to every issue facing us today. Uh, you can apply it to housing, a real crisis. You can apply it to wage discrepancies. Um, there are companies that are reducing the CEO salaries in order to equalize with their workers. Um, and, and those companies that are resisting that um, are facing public pressure, which is a good thing. Uh, and to frame this in a human rights, through a human rights lens, you um, just really need to look at the question of a living wage. What is, do we have a right to a living wage? This is very much alive in our, uh, our political debate in the United States, which is great. We have had, uh, Bernie Sanders ran a campaign last year or a year and a half ago, where uh, this, you know, he gave a major speech on economic rights. Do we have, you know, is it conceivable Europeans may not really understand the, uh, the horrific reality that if you, are, if you cannot afford expensive health insurance with the $8,000 annual deductible, you can die because you don't have that insurance and, no, and there is no remedy for it. Uh, so we've allowed that to happen. That's a human rights violation because adequate health care is absolutely a human right uh, according to international law. Um, so I think, you know, what, what we have to do is first prepare ourselves for these difficult explorations. We at the Carter Center are going through this ourselves. We are going through a deep exploration um, where we're looking, we're, we're carrying out truth telling exercises on institutional racism in the United States, um, looking at our own city, our own state, our own institutions. Where, uh, we're bringing religious groups to church, church groups together to look at the role of the church in slavery and Jim Crow and the ongoing systemic racism. These are tough conversations. So we have to be, prepare ourselves by saying, this is gonna be easy, it's not a Band-Aid. Um, and then you have to look at your sector and say, let me look down the line and see where my vulnerability, wh where are my investments? What am I involved in? Let me take a wider lens. Uh, uh, you know, stockholder uh, return, shareholder return is not, cannot be my only criteria. Who are the people we affect? Who are our workers? Who are the communities that we affect? We do human rights impact assessments in the Congo are, are with mining companies. What's the impact immediate for the communities? But what about the regulatory framework as well in the country? How do we help the Ministry of Mines in the Congo pass a mining code that will ensure that the revenues from those mines get into the public coffers, are transparent, are monitored and are spent appropriately on the needs of the people. So these are hard and long-term uh, efforts that have to be undertaken. Um, but you know, this is the good, this is the right conversation. You just have to prepare yourself for difficult discussions. Don't give up, set long-term objectives, but look broadly, widen your lens um, and look at those commitments, those human, read the treaties, read the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there are plenty of private sector agreements that have been entered into these um, various um, various voluntary organizations of, of, uh, for the private sector of uh, monitoring human rights. And, and you really have to take a look at those and see how you can gain. I think that your, especially with the younger generations, your businesses will be rewarded. You will have more impact um, and you'll be part of the, that movement. But, um, you know, thinking that, um, what they call greenwashing or whatever it is now for human rights, human rights washing for companies, that, that's just not good enough. Um, we have to go deeper and, and have long-term objectives. Great, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, I'm going to, um, we're gonna, uh, by the way, we're gonna take a, a Q and A after uh, the speakers have uh, given some in initial remarks. Um, Farid, uh, how can I get you unmuted? I'm going to turn it over to Farid uh, to discuss and pivot from 
the private sector, what is a basic human right uh, to what is going to uh, be the regulatory environment that these companies are going to be facing with EU taxonomy? Farid. Yeah, great. Um, hi, everyone. Farid. Um, sharing a few perspectives as well. Thank you so much, Gary. Very inspiring. Um, I'll start with uh, uh, basically um, the business case from companies increasingly is getting very, very strong. Um, you know, I've been working in that space for a bit more than 20 years. And I remember I was working with some mining companies uh, back, you know, 20 years ago, and they were still uh, reminding that they had to work harder on human rights because they knew that back in the 90s, Karin, you mentioned South Africa and Mandela. And actually, at the end of the day, what stopped um, and contributed significantly to stop apartheid in South Africa was basically that a good number of investors decided to ban South Africa and mining companies in South Africa because of a, a strong human rights violation in South Africa. And mining companies had basically to change completely their approach out there and support basically reform in country to export uh, products out of South Africa. And I worked on that um, through a mandate I had with UNDP. Uh, and the business case for those companies was fairly clear, although there was not any strong regulatory framework that could incentivize that. So uh, in um, 2010 or you know, 11, actually the UN guiding principles on, bio, on business and human rights came uh, purposely uh, to provide a framework which, at least it, it's been my experience, has been very, very helpful to clarify role of companies vis-a-vis uh, -vis role of, of state and, and for, you know, civil society expecting to put companies under pressure to know exactly or having greater clarity on the gray lines and what would really be good practice, bad practice from companies. Meaning at the end of the day that for 10 each year from now, starting from that uh, UN guiding uh, uh, principles on business and human rights, Greater clarity implies the following, and it's actually quite simple now. We've, we've, we've implemented that uh, quite extensively. Companies are expected to really um, proactively understand uh, their risks and how they can uh, violate human rights across their activities. And assuming that they have that maturity and get it right, and the basis is obviously the International Bill of Rights, which you, you mentioned, Karen, so the, the, the spectrum can be extremely broad. Um, then the second aspect is basically to be able to proactively uh, mitigate those risks. And the third aspect, which is extremely difficult, is to be capable to prove that there is effective risk mitigation um, from the perspective of those who are likely to, whose risk, uh, rights are likely to be violated. Meaning that it's not about me as a company putting efforts and resources to, to basically claim that I'm mitigating risk. It's basically taking the perspective of a right holder and get their perspective to confirm that they agree that my behavior my, as a company through my services, products, operations, whatever, um, has an effective impact to respect um, uh, human rights of, 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 of people, employees, contractors, communities, whatever people we're talking about. This has implied that um, it, it has just been driven by kind of um, company and leadership uh, to some extent under pressure of civil society. And now we're entering a very, very different uh, landscape, at least for what I can see in the, um, coming from regulatory frameworks in the European Union. Now we have a series of vehicles, um, and I would just name what is uh, impacting investors because that's, that's a very interesting angle. Uh, SFRD from EU Commission um, enacted back in 2019, Green Taxonomy um, enacted last year, have been very strong um, incentives to encourage companies willing to attract investments to demonstrate, and this is going to be increasingly the case, that they do no significant harm. That implies that should you want to attract investment, you must, um, increasingly by law, and this is supported actually also by a good number of uh, national level uh, regulatory frameworks calling for duty of vigilance. And at least in Europe, it's coming from, uh, uh, from, from different angles, but at least in Germany recently, France, uh, the UK took a different angle from modern slavery, 
Um, so there are multiple um, country level initiatives that are this year going to be uh, supported by EU directive on duty of vigilance, which are all kind of converging in the same direction. If I'm a CEO today, what I must be capable to prove when I'm in conversation with my investors is basically that I have a good sense on how I am capable to understand my human rights risks and what I'm doing to not do significant harm, meaning how I can actually uh, apply the guiding principles on business and human rights um, to demonstrate effective approach mitigating the risks. Um, and that's, that's really a game changer, I believe, increasingly. And we can see the pressure that is expressed by investors. We have some of our clients coming and asking really what they can do about that to clarify the responsibilities. Um, large corporations obviously are, are looking at that very closely. And because that kind of dynamic um, is something which basically is cascading across the value chain, if I'm a large corporation and some of my human rights risks basically are depending upon the behavior or the contribution of some of my suppliers or business partners, I must ask them what they're doing in this space. So basically this kind of cascading principle, um, which I believe is creating a very interesting dynamic. I would close just with an, a, a complementary um, regulatory framework, which I think is making uh, respect for human rights from the perspective of investors as much as from companies increasingly um, compulsory. Um, last year, uh, an additional uh, European Union uh, directive um, uh, non-financial reporting um, called CSRD and actually on the XAPA website there's a series of blogs and briefing papers providing much more details about those um, technical um, uh, instruments. Um, CSRD, Corporate um, Sustainability uh, Reporting Directive, encourages um, a very large number of companies in Europe starting 2026 from fiscal year 2023 to uh, report on extra financial information, which is going to be articulated with those information expected by investors that I, 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 present, uh, I shared a little bit earlier, meaning that um, uh, every, virtually every company uh, above a size of 250 full-time employee, uh, fiscal year 1st January 2023, Starting 2026, more or less, this is being um, uh, 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 defined in details, but basically that's the big picture. So really tomorrow, we'll have to report on a good number of indicators. And because investors are asking, are you, can you prove that you are not doing significant harm? That implies that increasingly a very large number of companies, from SMEs being included and foreign companies, not necessarily quoted in Europe, or within the European Union, but doing business with companies headquartered in the European Union, are basically to comply, share those data, prove information about, about those elements. So there are kind of two components out of that, and I will stop here. One that basically is compulsory driven uh, by regulatory framework, and the other one that is a little bit more kind of voluntary in terms of what companies are willing to disclose, but fundamentally they converge with each other. You cannot disclose information you don't have, you cannot prove um, without having something substantial to kind of back up, um, uh, you know, extra financial information. So it's, it's kind of, of, of converging. Um, so we kind of close here in terms of regulatory uh, uh, frameworks. Um, maybe just adding one uh, closing remark uh, about those, uh, th th those elements, and I'm hopeful that, that we have Vincent to kind of connect <laughs> uh, the dot with this discussion. Um, one thing has been to date through the UN guiding principles on business and human rights to demonstrate capacity to understand human rights and mitigate risks. And increasingly, and notably through more <laughs> sensitive um, landscapes or perspectives that can come from social justice, for sure, but climate and environmental issues as well, um, how to prove that whatever a company is doing has a positive impact. So, we're switching a little bit from pure risk adverse approach. I do no, I, I don't do significant harm to an approach where increasingly to be constructive, uh, to engage positively with stakeholders, with governments, with 
um, impact um, uh, investors with civil society, that's not enough. Uh, what's coming for the decade to come is how companies are capable to prove that only when and obviously they have an understanding of the negative, aspect, uh, uh, negative impact of whatever they're doing, but at the same time, they're capable to maximize um, the positive impact they can have on the society. And that's kind of a game changer. I think we're right in the middle of that. And that's extremely important because, um, because companies need to find differentiators, need to find purpose. And so building on, 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 on the regulatory framework, they understand increasingly that human rights in a broad sense is a concept that uh, actually also offer um, uh, inspiration to build um, a positive ecosystem around them and around their services. So I think we're just right there, and this implies to be pretty robust in terms of how to measure that and get uh, get clarity on uh, what good can look like in a way. And I'll close here for those initial ideas. I'm happy to uh, share and, and be challenged on with all of you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, it is a good segue because you know understanding again, the definition and then understanding the timeline and the regulatory framework. I absolutely want to come back to duty of vigilance uh, in the Q&A. Uh, but uh, now we are going to uh, turn to Vincent uh, Segarink uh, from the OECD, who is going to talk not only about uh, what you're doing at the OECD and the WISE Center, I'm sure you're going to explain that, but also uh, your program on the measurement, the impact management platform. So, uh, so let me just turn to Vincent, uh, his email address right here. But uh, Vincent, I'm going to drive on your slides. So tell me what you sure. know. Right. Thanks so much, uh, Julie, and, and thanks so much for Reed. I think um, uh, your last remark really gave me a great bridge into this, this conversation, what you mentioned about um, a kind of paradigm shift going you know, beyond just looking at risks to also looking at positive impacts. Um, so, I work at the OECD Center for Wellbeing, Inequality, Sustainability, and uh, Equality of Opportunity, or what we like to call the, the WISE Center. Um, and our work is really rooted in um, a little bit more than a decade's uh, amount of work on trying to measure progress in, in societies. And um, this work is really rooted in the experience of the global financial crisis, um, the realization among governments that um, you know, the, the statistics that we look at to measure progress in our societies aren't sufficient, um, that we need to take a more kind of multidimensional approach to understanding progress in our societies, um, that we need to look at the outcomes that are important for people, um, and that we need to consider inequalities in a, in a um, robust way in, in our measurement systems. Um, and so that is where I am coming into this conversation. And traditionally, we have mo focused mostly on working with governments. Um, since a few years, given this momentum that Farid has described, um, we have also turned our eye to how businesses are measuring um, their non-financial performance and um, particularly leveraging our experience in, in the social area where I think there is um, still, uh, you know, a degree of, of clarity that is lacking in terms of, of how it can be measured. Um, and so I want to just talk a, a little bit about some of our thoughts in this area. I want to keep it relevant, though, for, for this audience, because um, I would say that we are a fairly ambitious player in this landscape. I think um, the suggestions that we are making, you know, in terms of measurement are, are, are forward looking. Um, and I, I realize that not all businesses, investors, or even regulators are quite where we, where we are yet. And so um, I'll also talk a little bit of, about some of the other tools that the OECD has, has available. So Julie, maybe we can cycle um, through these slides quite quickly. I mean, the first thing that, that I want to emphasize is that um, you know, different actors come to this landscape with different objectives. So even within uh, you know, groups like companies and investors. Um, indeed, some companies and investors are primarily interested in minimizing their risks. Um, and we have tools for that and, and measurement frameworks for that. Others are starting to consider, you know, how their, um, their, their operations, both in their own uh, operations or in the supply chain, are impacting um, stakeholders. And 
Um, I think it is really there where, where we need to progress really as a community to try to, to develop better, better measures. Um, so on the next slide, we will we'll see some of the things that um, people tend to think about in, in these different categories. And I try to, uh, to organize these in terms of indeed the distinction Farid made between um, acting to reduce harm and benefiting stakeholders and contributing to solutions. Um, in the area of acting to reduce harm, um, you know, we, we have quite a body of, of, of tools, of resources, uh, of standards that um, allow companies and investors to understand, um, you know, their performance and, and how they can improve their performance. And um, I understand that this landscape can be intimidating. And one of the things that we are trying to do, and I'll speak to a little bit later, is to organize that landscape a little bit uh, a little bit more, but to some extent, I think we have some of the resources there in the area of benefiting stakeholders. As I said, I think we need to make a little bit more progress. Um, now, what does this yield yield in terms of you know the the, the kind of metrics that uh, investors look at? Uh, so, on the next slide, we'll see an exercise that we have done, and I think others as well. Um, where we compared ESG, ESG ratings between different providers. Um, and we really find that these ratings um, yield very different conclusions, right? So many, so different providers might come up with uh, a very different idea of, of how a company is performing in terms of ESG issues. Um, I think this is partially because um, there are different interpretations of what ESG issues should um, should measure kind of from a philosophical perspective, but there's also a, a big data challenge there. Um, and so I think this really shows uh, kind of the, 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 the idea that in the landscape, um, the nature of, of, of ESG issues and the social dimension particularly uh, is still a little bit um, inconclusive. Um, so on the next slide, you'll see um, what we are doing to, to provide some clarity uh, in the social dimension. Um, so here I'm really speaking to uh, what I was referring to in terms of trying to improve metrics on, on how we can benefit stakeholders. Um, so the, OEC, uh, the OECD has uh, for 10 years been the host of, of uh, an influential framework called the OECD Wellbeing Framework. This is a multi-dimensional progress framework that governments across the world are, are using um, to understand um, the outcomes that matter to people in a lot of different dimensions. And um, I should say that you know, these dimensions are closely linked also with um, the types of issues that we look at when, when it comes to human rights. So things like um, safety and security, uh, civic engagement and having a voice, health, housing, um, income and wealth, et cetera. Um, so recently what we have done is we, we've tried to see how our framework can be helpful for businesses. Um, it's, uh, it, it's been a big undertaking and, and probably uh, too big to, to really elaborate on here, but basically we're seeing four different broad categories of social impacts that firms have. Um, the resources that they contribute to society as a whole. So these are things like the taxes they pay, uh, research and development, and then the well-being of a number of important stakeholder groups being employees. So the well-being of employees in the workforce and inequalities. Um, this, uh, the third is impact of products and consumer well-being. And finally, stakeholder well-being in the supply chain. So these could be employees and communities. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to see what metrics we already have to understand uh, the well-being of these stakeholders and where there are gaps. Um, and we're trying to work on those gaps. Um, and so far, we have done that in primarily the area of employee well-being. Um, maybe one, I'll, I'll add one, one thing here, and that is that when we came into this discussion, we primarily see that um, businesses and investors tend to look at um, the inputs or activities that companies are doing to improve um, stakeholder, stakeholder well-being. Um, and one of the things that we're trying to suggest is um, to really focus on measuring the outcomes that are important to, to individuals. And I, I can say a little bit more about how to do that um, yeah, afterwards. Now I'll try to wrap it up 
um, just to say that you know if you're interested or when you when you're a beginner in this conversation and this speaks to the next slide um, if you're interested in really understanding um, you know the the human rights risks in your company and in your supply chain you're first going to want to turn to some of these um, resources that the OECD also hosts. So the, the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises and our due, due diligence guidance. So these are guidelines that really operationally help companies and investors to understand how they can track um, to how they can track human rights risks and impacts in uh, their company and in the supply chain. But again, um, hopefully in the future we can go a little bit. Uh, beyond that. Um, and finally, I just wanted to pitch this um, platform that we have built uh, on the next slide called the Impact Management Platform. Um, so this is a platform that aims to clarify the landscape around impact management and measurement. It provides an overview of, um, you know, what it takes to, you know, measure and manage your impacts for an organization or in, an investor and provides a list of, of resources and an explanation for how these are um, uh, connected to each other. Um, we didn't do this alone. We collaborated on this platform with the UN, with other international organizations, as well as with um, really all the, the standard setters that are involved with the landscape. So GRI, SASB, which is now VRF, um, uh, the, the uh, World Benchmarking Alliance, um, this is really a shared product to uh, guide practitioners in understanding how our collective resources relate to each other um, and to provide clarity. And so we really hope that this will be helpful um, for organizations and investors that are um, trying to, to get clarity on the landscape. And I think we can leave it there for now. Terrific. Thank you so very much. That was a, a lot of information from all three of our speakers um, over this uh, short period of time. Um, so I'm going to, um, uh, did you wanna to speak to this slide at all? Uh, we're, we're terrific. So now we are going to move into the Q&A uh, session of our uh, presentation here today. Um, while we're starting to see some population in the chat room, um, I wanted to throw out one for uh, Karen to start, but I, I think all three of the speakers can can uh, discuss this. But you know, Karen, you had discussed several areas of the standard of living, um, which were basic human rights, right? Um, education, uh, wage, uh, healthcare, etc. Um, can you expound on, let's say, healthcare or education? There's some such very different cultural differences between what's going on in the EU, in European Union, what's going on in the United States. So what, what, do we, what does one need to do to move and accelerate progress in this area, for one, because it's gonna affect Fareed and the regulations and how is that standardizing? How is that kind of coming together and converging across the continents? Um, and then how do you measure that in the standardization? So Karen, I'll give it to you. Well, thank you. Um... This is, you know, it, it, it's so funny because my European friends or my Canadian friends or my friends from anywhere else in the world cannot believe the concept that you have to pay thousands and th like 25% of your income for health insurance. And then you have the honor of having to then pay $8,000 before the insurance kicks in. You know, this is like, it's outrageous. It's outrageous. I mean, just that in itself. And there are many other examples when it comes to housing and these other issues, but healthcare, you know, and health and, you know, I, I'm not afraid to say this, health insurance companies uh, profit when they deny care to people who need care. This is well established. That is a human rights violation. Um, you know, it was understood at, at you know, in, in the forties and fifties that um, elderly people who can no longer work probably shouldn't be allowed to die in abject poverty in the gutter. <laughs> so they created this thing called social security and we pay into it as we work. And then at least you have some money to buy food. It's very small. Um, so it's the American system. We, you know, me and my friends have begun calling it extreme capitalism because it's not that capitalism hasn't produced important inventions and, and, and energy around uh, progress, but you have to, you have to, you have to uh, mitigate its worst 
behavior. And we do it in some ways. We do have some Section 8 certificates for housing so that people who are poor can get housing, but not enough. So it's, um, you know, I think we had, you have to look at the basic human rights, right? Um, health, adequate standard of living, that is the broad framework. So within that is, is included housing, uh, health care, um, and Europeans understand this very well. You know, it's like, you need it, you get it. You know, education. Again, it, it, the education system in the United States is just a, is a, a source of great shame for us. Um, that, you know, in wealthy neighborhoods, you have very nice schools, public schools, and in poor neighborhoods, you don't. There's not equality in the standard of education. You have educational standards, but it's not the same as a high quality environment for learning um, or access to a secondary education. So um, we are living in, you know, the, guild, the new Gilded Age, as they say, and this has got to change. There's a tussle over that in, in my country, as you know, uh, where um, it's been, it, the political dynamics are not in our favor right now, but we are working, you know, those of us who believe in this idea are trying to reach out to to um, across the different ideological divides to say, wait a minute, you know, we're all in this together. And if you're poor and white or black or Latino, you have the same interests and the, 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 um, the gap in wealth is so extreme it affects all of, all of those, you know, 98% of the country. So, um, you know, it's a real battle right now. I'm not gonna lie, you know, but the, there are many people um, working on it, trying to figure out how to get through uh, the politics of it. And, and part of it is to kind of rise above the politics of it. That's what we have to do. And, and I think um, on the liberal side, what we have to do better at, at is taking the politics out of it and making our case to average people um, to, to, to bring people into a conversation about equality. So that's, that's the tough, uh, there's no good news uh, right now from the United States of America uh, on this front to talk about um, getting through that, that political hurdle, but there are lots of ideas. And I feel like we're in this very creative and angry and creative time. And um, uh, you know, our intention is to keep working on it until we, we build a more solid coalition around solutions uh, and uh, away from this, these hot ideological battles. Thank you so much for that. Fareed, are you, would you care to uh, jump in and you know, discuss maybe cultural issues, the standardization? If you're a corporation and you're in the United States, you're in Europe, um, you've got operations across uh, jurisdictions, um, how are the regulations going to uh, play out in your mind? Oops, I have to unmute you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Um... I mean, I think uh, building on that concept of extreme capitalism, uh, there are kind of two ways to look at that, even from a business perspective. Uh, a business, most businesses at least, must uh, uh, operate in a predictable environment. Uh, I mean, you need to plan. That's basically core to business. And extreme capitalism, um, skyrocketing inequalities, are uh, building geopolitical turmoils are building frustrations, are basically destroying uh, predictability. So, I mean, the business case from that perspective can be actually quite simple. I mean, if you want predictability, there is necessarily a moment when extreme capitalism is becomes a problem, really. Um, you can actually also look at that from a different perspective and talking about business case and, and consider that, you know, building an adequate standard of living is, 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 is something that uh, enables uh, to build, you know, greater loyalty of employees, uh, better uh, purchasing power of, of, of potential consumers. I mean, you can look at that from whatever angle you want, but at the end of the day, if you're pushing a little bit too hard um, and to, uh, to some extreme um, uh, inequalities, poverty, vulnerability, it's not good for business. That's it. So. <laughs> Um, framing, if I frame that differently, you know, operating across different environments um, from a business perspective, some companies get it, 
Um, in, in the past, I, I think that there's been some kind of leadership approaches, exploring how to ensure that, for example, employees, no matter where they are based, have access to a certain level of, of, of you know, fringe benefits or whatever. I mean, it's been, it's, it's for some uh, jurisdictions, it's pretty basic. For some others, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a big progress. Um, what's changing, if you look at that again, from, um, uh, I'd look at that from a combination between uh, human right on the one hand and, um, and competitiveness or attractiveness of companies on the other end. As at the end of the day, that um, if there are so many uh, companies which are increasing, which increasingly care about those topics, it's because they understand um, that beyond predictability, the question of attractiveness is important to them. So if you want to recruit talent, if you want to be accepted wherever you operate, if you want, you know, to secure long-term relationship with consumers, uh, the cost of being proactive embracing um, some positive impact from a human right perspective in a broad sense is lower than the contrary. Um, so it's, I would just stop here to make sure that others can, can react and maybe we can address other questions, but I think it's, uh, it used to be leadership and I suspect it's increasingly um, just has to become standard practice to operate. Yeah, thank you so much, Fareed. Uh, Vincent, I'm going to ask you too. I had um, you know, prepared a question about standardization of platforms, you know, given cultural differences, uh, you know, across uh, the social sector. Um, can you talk about your experience in trying to standardize all your partners that you have here on the platform partners and um, the measurement and the reporting and how, how have you engaged and what are some of the, what are some of the, the uh, hot points uh, or the, the challenges in trying to aggregate stakeholder standardization? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. And I, I just want to say that, you know, I agree with Farid. I mean, there, there's a wealth of evidence to suggest that inequalities are um, detrimental for society from many perspectives, whether it's, you know, um, productivity, um, you know, uh, health outcomes, um, crime. I mean, there, there's human capital. Um, you, you can list a whole stream of things that or, or ways in which societies um, suffer from inequalities, right? And so if you think about the TCFD and the idea of labeling climate change as a threat that, you know, is relevant for all companies in, in our society, you know, you could equally say inequality is, is a threat to all um, you know, enterprises in our economy, because ultimately, if we erode our human capital, um, then, 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 then that will be a shared um, threat to enterprise value, right? And so, one of the um, one of our aims is to increase the evidence base on how um, well-being outcomes and, and social outcomes um, affect enterprise value, because. Um, yes, we see that there are differences across jurisdictions in how we interpret, um, you know, uh, non-financial reporting um, with some jurisdictions being more favorable to, you know, what is called the double materia materiality approach and others being a little bit more reluctant. Um, but I think ultimately, um, uh, you know, we should all be able to rally around the fact that that social outcomes are important for both, for both societies and, and, and for businesses. And so um, we're trying to, to, to bridge some of those, um, some of those differences. Um, and on a very pragmatic level, you know, I think that, yes, there is fragmentation right now uh, in the market. There are different standard setters. Um, ultimately, you know, when you really look at them and, and, and start comparing them, we see um, similar you know, uh, similar measurements, similar uh, indicators showing up in, in, in those different, um, uh, um, uh, you know, standards. Um, and so I think, you know, ultimately, I think we will weed through these differences and then I think we'll see some more consolidation in the market over the next few years, which we, we have already seen um, over, uh, over the past year, right? Thank you so much for that. Um, Vincent, I'm going to come back to you on a question from the chat room, <clears throat> something very specific uh, to the OECD. Uh, there was a question about the different uh, differenti uh, differentiated locales, priorities, and an impact, impact matrix. What insights has the OECD gathered from 
the project betterlifeindex.org. Better life. Yeah. Yeah, I saw the comment. So this is really relevant. Uh, the Y Center hosts the Better Life Index, and this is our kind of public facing platform that, that uh, exposes our, our well-being framework. And it is this framework that we have used now for our approach to um, measuring the social, uh, social performance of firms. So we um, have used the experience that we ourselves, but also national statistical offices in OECD countries, have accumulated in terms of um, measuring well-being outcomes. Um, and we're going to use that to propose some new metrics for businesses. Again, as I said before, these are going to be quite ambitious metrics, right? So if you're a beginner, um, you're, you're probably not going to want to start there. Uh, we are currently primarily working with pioneers. Um, but if you are um, you know, more advanced and you want to do more and you want to anticipate the developments that are, are going to come in the next few years, then this, this is something that you might want to look at. Um, our, our paper is coming out uh, in, in, in the next week or two. So if you're interested in seeing that, um, you can shoot me a message. Great. For anybody who's listening, uh, a new paper coming from the OECD. Um, Fried, I'm going to uh, pivot to you. Um, CEOs are facing quite literally an overwhelming amount of information related to ESG, let alone sifting through uh, the focus on the human rights and the social component. What are the next steps or some actionable items, actionable steps that a CEO or a leader could could uh, use to outline or engage, be ahead of the curve of the regulatory environment with either their board or, or other stakeholders? Um, this is something coming our way um, quite a lot and the conclusion is, is, is actually quite simple. Um, a CEO has to lead with purpose, um, basically, and, and, and give kind of a vision. So. It's actually being able to get rid of, I would say, the width and the details to fundamentally be capable to share two uh, things. One, how my business, whatever I'm doing, has a positive impact on a broad spectrum of what society needs. So um, happiness, people development, something positive that actually has a human right component into it. And this needs to be done with high maturity of the um, uh, potential uh, adverse impact that any business basically has with it. So it's being clear on the, the value proposition with positive impact, with maturity on the negative impact, um, to have a plan basically to understand how that plan has to be mitigated. So sometimes you can have a very positive impact from a social perspective, but very bad climate footprint. <laughs> and then what's the plan? What's the roadmap to kind of, you know, uh, share a vision and, and project basically the company in a few years from now, um, you know, mitigating the negative uh, uh, aspect and uh, amplifying the positive contribution to society. And here you have a, basically a, a nice story uh, that investors understand, uh, employees understand, and you know, other stakeholders, government, civil society understand. And you're part of the solution, not part of the problem. And can I just ask a follow-up, um, you know, question to that, where, uh, you know, where, where would it, where does it sit within an organization? Where does human rights sit? Is it with the strategy person? Is it with operations? Is it with a chief sustainability officer that may or may not have gravitas within the organization? Is it corporate communications? Uh, you know, doesn't it seems to be all over. Free. Um, it's it used to be um, um, a topic for experts, and it is increasingly becoming a topic which require broad top management alignment. Um, so my answer is kind of mixed because you still need at some point to be rooted in some fairly technical and complex issue. I mean, as Karen said at the beginning, it's, it, it's, it, there are difficult topics uh, beyond um, the concept of human rights. So it's, it can be fairly technical and, and, and you might 
have to discuss things you just don't want to hear or see in your business. So it's it, it can be pretty technical and, and, and difficult. So that expertise is required. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, top management does not want to be caught by surprise. So has to have a you know some uh, some 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 understanding and maturity on the topic. And that's something we see. I mean, that's something we ask ourselves in terms of. Uh, you know, starting from the complexity to to clarify at the end of the day the, um, the top line that is coming out of that. So it's a make, and I think it's positive because the more there are people, the less it is something uh, you know owned by um, a technical expert. The more it it, it means um, that we're talking about something that is embraced and has um, is valued uh, across you know organizations. I should say. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to pivot to Karen now. Um, I'm going to unmute you here. Um, I'm asking the question. There we go. Um, you know, you had described some of the challenges or the obstacles that uh, the social justice or some of the, the standard of living uh, opportunities uh, are, are, are facing in the United States. Um, what will trip up a leader trying to implement human rights reform? What obstacles are they, they going to face? Uh, within, with internally and then externally, I guess. Too. Yeah, and, and it sort of relates to the last discussion here, because I I agree that top management, top leadership needs to be leading this. You can't have, you know, a sustainability officer over here that's kind of like the the advocate or the thorn in the side. You know, the kind of the poker. You know, it's always poking and saying, "Hey, but you haven't thought of this." You know, it's it doesn't work. Um, it's too adversarial. Um, you, you you do need advocates within an organization, but the, you know, I, I think to back up a little bit before I answer your question, I think what would be beneficial would be for leadership of companies to like go have a retreat and get some real discussions. Don't have it be some side thing, you know, kind of really dig deep, reach out to some of the organizations. You've already heard the UN, various UN resources that exist, but you have Businesses, business for human rights, you have the Center for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. You have these organizations that have really thought hard about how to help companies and governments match the regulatory challenges with the private sector challenges. There, there's thinking that has been done on this. But oftentimes, I think companies are caught off guard, as you've described, or they, they treat those groups as adversaries. Um, and so they don't, there isn't, you know, and I don't know, it's, it could be uh, the opposite now. There may be many companies that have really worked to include them, but I do think it has to go high up because once, um, it, it, because every, any CEO is going to confront huge challenges when they're trying to do this because they are a private sector company. They have shareholder profits as, as the principal objective. You know, it's like, so you have to expect this is going to be difficult. And so you, what you want to do, um, and this, I mentioned this earlier, but what you want to do is do a kind of deep dive, really um, profound exercise. Um, what we're doing at the Carter Center is studying a book called Cast um, by Isabel Wilkerson that really looks at how, um, how slavery started. You know, it's like really going to the beginnings and looking deep so that you see everything around you in that lens. And then you as a leader can say, oh, this is happening because that happened. And these are why the, there, these inequalities exist. So I need to shift this over here. You know, this little bit by bit solutions is not going to really get us, uh, band-aids are not going to get us to where we want to go. We have to go deeper. We have to be thoughtful and profound. Reach out to these organizations, bring them in, really consult. Um, you know, that's really what the only thing I can offer, because I think, you know, what I what I heard earlier about positive stories, I agree that that's so important to say how your company is benefiting. But oftentimes companies will use this um, as sort of a fig leaf or say, look at all the good we're doing. Look at everything that plastic has done to improve the lives of people. You know, I have so many plastic items in my house and it makes my life better. Um, you know, but what about those islands of plastics in the ocean? So we... I would just be careful, uh, you know, using the sort of positive story approach if you're not doing that deeper dive. Um, so I think they go together. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. That was a very thoughtful answer. I what you're what you're all describing, and 
is, is it's got to be in the ethos of a company. Ethos can't be any you know one department, etc. So, uh, and uh, and also uh, including your comment, Karen, con unattended consequences. Know how it benefits, but understand what's happening on the back end. So we're running out of time, and I just wanted to give um, any of our speakers, Vincent, Karen, Farid, to um, have any comments, closing comments um, for our, uh, our audience here. Um, and if not, I just want to also uh, state that uh, all three of these websites, sapa.org, the cartercenter.org, oecdwise.org, or oec.org, wise, uh, W-I-S-E, have a plethora of information on this human rights issue, blogs, white papers, webinars. And so I would encourage everybody who's listening here today uh, to continue their educational progress um, with these three organizations. But um, any last words, Farid? I think, um, and I fully agree, Karin, actually, by, by the way, that's actually why I, on the point of not being exclusively just on the positive front without you know, neglecting all the negative impacts. So it's, it's, it's a matter of balance, fully, fully, fully agreed. Um, I would just close with something um, I'm hopeful that might be optimistic to kind of help a uh, different um, stakeholder to kind of converge somewhere. Um, when you look at uh, the concept of happiness, who does not want happiness to happen in our world? Um, it should be normally um, part of a political agenda, business or whatever. Um, there are two structural elements that make happiness happen. On the one hand, it's important to get to a certain level of, uh, of um, living standard, um, wage and, and other aspects, it's important. But beyond a certain level of, um, of living standard, there is no more happiness happening to people. So the second aspect, which balances uh, access to happiness, uh, starting from a certain living standard, comes with uh, connection with other people, um, capacity to care, um, and all those aspects that make, I would say, real life social network a reality. And human rights, at the end of the day, is partly about that. It's easier to, in, to violate human rights when you're not in direct connection with human people. Uh, <laughs> it's, it becomes more difficult when, uh, as part of your personal and collective navigation to happiness, you happen to have that kind of, of, of good mix um, of good uh, social interaction, real life social interaction with others. And so I'll just close with that. I think at the end of the day, the more we're capable to build uh, a joint um, approach, uh, converging agendas of you know, business, civil society, multilateral organizations and foundations and others, around ultimately how we can collectively build greater ha collective happiness, uh, the more we can mitigate and address those human rights risks kind of um, naturally, you know, just because it becomes part of the Addressing human rights is part of the solution, not again part of the of the problem. So I just stop that and um, as um, a closing word on happiness. Thank you for that, uh, Vincent. How about you? Yeah, <laughs> no, that's uh, again a great segue. I'll I'll try to tie that to to happiness uh, to measurement. Um, you know, there's there's such a tradition now of social science on measuring well-being. And when we say well-being, we really mean all the different things that are important for life. So income, wealth, social connections, um, you know, satisfaction with your job. Um, we, we can measure this, right? And Tabiz, uh, Farid asked, um, you know, who doesn't want happiness? Well, let me tell you, a lot of businesses don't want to measure happiness or job satisfaction or people's satisfaction with their, well, where, with their health because they don't trust these types of measures. Um, they are afraid of, of, of what they're going to find, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, what we're trying to do is, is, is drive a cultural change where these types of measures are going to become acceptable um, metrics of social performance. And um, we are always looking for allies uh, along the way. So um, that, that's my uh, pitch. Great. Thank you. Karin, any last word? I'll give you the last word. There you go. I'm going to unmute you. There you go. Yeah, OK. Um, you know, in our founding documents in the United States, it's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is in our <laughs> in America's founding documents. And, and, and I think, uh, you know, for us, the job is really to um, 
find a way to rise above the, 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 the very divided politics of the time um, because everything uh, falls away. And we are doing that. We're having very private roundtable discussions with evangelical leaders, with uh, across the aisle, political, uh, you know, different political parties um, to pursue this. Um, and, and back to what Farid said about social connection. I mean, we have to reconnect with each other and see our common humanity uh, in each other and, and begin to, to do that work because we've been very, you know, it's very, uh, we have been purposely very divided for political reasons. And so we have to do the work of undoing that and finding solutions. So we're determined to do it. It's gonna take a long time, um, but uh, I'm encouraged to learn about all of these efforts um, at the OECD and other places to really measure and help um, but I do think that kind of human to human conversation part of it is crucial because then it, you get it out of the uh, kind of technocrat kind of my thing, your thing uh, uh, way of doing it and say, let's, let's just work for, for people. You know, what would a people centered economy look like? What would a human rights centered economy look like? Ask that question and just go through it with your companies and say, what would it look like? You know, uh, ask those questions. And I just, again, please reach out to these organizations, Business for Human Rights, the Center for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. They are experts in this and would uh, really engage constructively with you. Great, thank you. Uh, great way to end our session here today, the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of human rights for all. So thank you, Fareed Badash. Karen Ryan, Vincent Segarink, thank you so very much for being here today. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.